right. I'm back. You guys hear me? I'm back. I don't know if this is on or not. Um, yeah, I know that. Hold on. Wait, did someone say the slides were working? All right. Um, yeah, like half of our CS125 cloud is down. So if you go to the slides, I think they will work. Um, it'll take a minute to load, and then it looks blank, but hit the X and close that, and then they will load. I'm using the same thing you guys are using. So um, I just tried to tweak something a minute ago to get this back online. We have like 12 machines set up, uh, configured into a, essentially our own private cloud that we use to run a lot of the infrastructure for the course, whether that's the slides, the playground, auto grading, which is also down right now. Um, at some point last night, about half of those machines looked like they went offline. Um, the management interface that I usually use to kind of reboot them is also offline. So anyway, the, the IT people know about this, um, and I will go breathe fire at them later. But here we are, and happily, we don't have to use the playground today because we're going to keep talking about the internet and keep talking about the web. All right, so this is a, this is a fun day. Last time, we started to talk about what the internet is, and we looked at that in a couple of different dimensions. By the way, there'll be attendance for today will probably not be counted. I'm not going to make any promises. I'll look at what the data looks like. Um, all right, so based on our conversation last time, we observed the fact that most of the internet, uh, first of all, the internet is reliant on a huge amount of infrastructure. This is probably like trillions of dollars that have been put into things that are eventually, have be eventually become the internet. A lot of it's been built on top of older infrastructure, whether that was you know, fiber optic cables that followed the old train lines, or the fact that for years, a lot of the signals that made their way to your house traveled over lines that were built for previous communication systems, like the phone lines and stuff like that. Most of this infrastructure provides wired connections, but you guys have gotten increasingly used to having wireless as your last hop, right? So in here, as you wander around campus, a lot of times, how many people actually have a, have a computer that is plugged in to an actual ethernet jack? How many people have one of those? Okay, so about half of you, yeah. That's becoming increasingly rare, right? And this is my main machine, and it almost never gets actually plugged into something, uh, other than power. All right. You know, the internet revolution is largely made possible by really high-quality glass that we've used to create these fiber optic cables. It's one of the unheralded wonders of the modern world. It's all of this glass cable that we built to carry these signals around so that we can connect with each other. All right. And we also talked a little bit about the wireless infrastructure in this space, or the short-range wireless, all of these access points. I have no idea how many there are. Um, this is also an example of this really kind of beautiful, fascinating, completely organic system, right? Nobody manages all the Wi-Fi access points in this country. They're just thrown up all over the place. If you go to New York City, you go to Chicago, you go to an urban center, if you take your phone out, you know, into the denser part, one of the denser parts of town, a lot of times you can see like hundreds of Wi-Fi access points, right? Imagine a, you know, apartment building. Every single apartment's got at least one, if not several. Um, and then we also have all of this medium range wireless uh, infrastructure that we built up to allow you to be connected even when you're outside the range of Wi-Fi. So again, all of this building, all of this infrastructure, all of this investment devoted to one thing, moving information around allowing people to communicate with each other across time and space in a way that was never possible before, right? You know, computers are part of the technological revolution that you guys are living in, but the internet is a huge enabler, right? If we just had a bunch of computers that weren't connected to anything else, I mean, it might be fun to play games on, it might use them to solve some problems and stuff like that, but the con connectivity that we've achieved has really enabled some cool things, and we're gonna get back to that later today when we talk about web APIs and web, web interfaces. All right, so at this point, we have billions and billions of devices that are all connected to the shared medium and can send uh, information to each other. They can send signals. You can think of these as signals for now, right? I can send some type of signal. Um, and last time, we also talked a little bit about the protocol that the internet establishes for exchanging information between two computers that are connected to it. That IP protocol specifies two things, right? One is 
how do we address each other, right? If I want to send a, or establish a um, connection with a particular computer, I need to know how to address the data that I send to it so that the data will get there. How do I know where this signal is trying to go? And also, when it wants to send me some information back, how does it know where to contact me? Okay, so this is IP addressing, and we've seen several generations of this now over time, from the original IP address space, which was only big enough, in theory, to address four billion machines, uh, but in reality, uh, actually allowed us to address far fewer than that, um, to this new IPv6 address space that's increasingly being used that allows us to address just an unfathomable number of computers. This is all we need, for sure. These addresses are less readable because they're bigger. They contain more information. And then IP also specifies a, uh, a format or a data st uh, structure for those messages. So that structure contains the addresses that we talked about, but it also contains data. That's what we're trying to move around, the content of your news feed, the content of your text messages, the content of your request you send to Amazon to purchase something, the content of the little messages that your computer sends back to our server that let us know whether or not you're following along in class, data. Okay. All right, so one of the fascinating um, stories from the early evolution of the internet was this big, and I'm not gonna talk about this, hopefully not for very long, although it really is really interesting, this big struggle over two models of connectivity. So I put this, so, so some of you may or may not see a photo like this. So this, this is an old telephone exchange. How many people have ever dialed the operator before for any reason? Anybody? People do that anymore? I don't know, like just for fun? Just to, like pull, pull a prank? So when the, t when the telephone lines were first established, every phone call started with the operator. Because literally, oh, man, this is really, we're struggling with this today. Your first call, when you picked up the phone, what would happen is that you would end up talking to some nice person. Because your phone connected to a switchboard like this. And the operator would need to know, where do you want to place the call? And you would say, oh, I wanna call my friend Joe over at whatever. And a lot of times, if it was a call that was in town, the operator knew you, which is someone that you would see around, it might be a, even a friend of yours or a neighbor. They knew where other people lived, et cetera, et cetera. So they would say, okay, I'll connect you to, to Joe. And they would literally, you see what this, this person is doing? They're actually like, plugging wires in, like one into these, these spots. So essentially, Joe's phone is connected to one of these, um, one of these pegs in the switchboard, and the way you establish a connection between two phones was literally like you would plug in a, you know, she, the, the operator would plug in something to that jack, and now there's a, a literal physical connection, there's a wire that's connecting you and your friend. Their phone starts to ring, when they pick up, the connection is established and you're talking to each other, but the operator did all of this. And for, for many of you, I think, you know, when, when people are asked about how the internet works, this is the model that we still have, is that somehow, like when you go to Facebook, there's like a wire that leads directly from you to Facebook that's only used for your communication, right? Not used for anybody else. Because as soon as you set up one of these circuits, the only two people talking on it are you and your friend, right? It's literally as if you had two headsets with a wire connecting them. And the operator's just here to kind of make this one switch that needs to happen so that that can actually take place. What we actually do online, on the internet, is something that's called packet switching. And when this was, um, you know, invented or theorized, this caused a huge debate within the telecommunication telecommunication community. Um, between people that thought that this was the future, who turned out to be right, and the phone companies that were incredibly uh, determined to preserve this old model of phone circuits, right? So that's what they understood. The phone companies, this was sort of like the first time that you see a major, you know, uh, technology company have to go through a completely paradigm shifting innovation. You know, Netflix did this, right? Netflix started out by sending CDs around in the mail. They got really good at that. And now they're actually making their own shows and doing streaming. So they've actually managed to 
uh, perform a really impressive pivot within the space of streaming. A lot of people said Netflix is done, right? You know, what all, all, all Netflix got good at was sending DVDs around in the mail. They're not going to know how to do anything else. It turned out they were wrong. But that's a pretty impressive thing to be able to do. The telecom companies were really good at building these circuit switch networks. And so at some point, people came along and said, hey, I have a different idea for how to do this. First of all, we need data that we can break up. So this is inherently involves digital information. These old phone networks are not transmitting digital signals. These are transmitting analog signals, okay? It's like a speaker wire. There's a, you know, sine wave running through that that goes from your house to your friend's house. What we do online is that everything is digitized. So everything is turned into numbers. Remember when we talked at the very beginning of the semester, we talked about the fact that in order for computers to process information, we have to turn it into numbers, okay? So your phone call, the contents of your speech have to be able to, converted, to be converted into a series of numbers, right? That's what we do with sound. We take sound and we convert it to a series of numbers that measure the strength of the pressure wave at a particular point in time, okay? And we can use those numbers to reconstruct the sound at the other end, but this is step one. We digitize things. Once we do that, now I have something that I actually can break nicely into little pieces. And these pieces are called packets, okay? Every packet on the internet contains a certain amount of information. And normally, in order to transmit anything that's even of reasonable size, like if you want to download a photo, or you want to even go to a website and just look at the content of a web page, or you want to stream audio or video, what happens is that data reaches you in a series of chunks called packets. Each packet contains some small amount of the movie, some little bit of the photo one or two of the characters in the tweet, right? Actually, tweets probably fit into one packet. They're pretty small, right? But emails probably take multiple packets. So one part of the email, another part of the email. It's broken up in little pieces. And each one of those pieces goes on a separate journey across the internet from the start point to the end point. And along the way, they may follow different paths. So if you're on, if you're talking to a, a server in California, some of your data may go one way and some of your data may go another way. We saw, based on that map last time, that there's a bunch of different paths that data could take from here to California. So when you go to Facebook and check your news feed or Instagram and look at photos, some of the photo might come, you know, through, you know, uh, you know some of it might come, you know, one direction, some of it might come another direction, okay? So one of the things that's cool about the internet protocol as well is that the internet protocol does not guarantee anything about reliable delivery. So this is one of the really important and very powerful things about the internet protocol. It doesn't try to do too much. All it does is two things. It says, look, I will give you a way to figure out how to identify hosts that connect to the internet. That's the address name. And then I'm gonna provide what's called best effort packet transmission. So computers that are part of the internet backbone, that are what are called routers, they'll just do the following thing all day long. They take a packet that they receive over one of their connections. So they're connected to at least, uh, they have at least three incoming connections, sometimes more. They uh, receive a packet on one of their connections and they look at it and they make this split second decision about which one of the other connections they're gonna route it over. So it's like, you know, you're, you're standing there, someone gives you a piece of information, and you can either go right or you can go left. It's all it does, all day long, at as fast, at the highest speeds possible. And so all that router is doing is trying to get the packet one stop closer. So basically, there's a router in the middle of the country. And if you're online with a computer in California, it sees a packet coming from you, it looks at the destination, and it says, I know how to get this packet one hop closer, so I know that I can send it to another computer that I'm connected to. If I'm located in Colorado, maybe that other computer is located in California, okay? So it's not to the destination yet because it hasn't arrived to Facebook server, but that's, that computer in California is closer to where it wants to go. And so this is all they do all day long. Now, what happens if the router gets overloaded? Let's say that suddenly a lot of people want to send data back and forth to a particular place and a router can't keep up with the amount of data that's coming across it. What does it do? Drops packets. 
yeah, this is, this is, uh, routers are allowed to drop packets. The internet protocol doesn't guarantee anything about the packet making it there. So you may send a request to California, and halfway to California, the request may end up at a router that's like, you know what, I've got way too much work to do. I don't even have any space left to store these new requests. I'm just gonna drop yours. And poof, it's gone. Now obviously in order for the internet to work properly, you have to do something about that, and that's gonna go into, you know, things that I'm not gonna talk about here that, but are, that are very, very interesting. But the IP protocol does not guarantee anything about reliable delivery. All it does is say, we'll do our best to try to move your data from where it came from to wherever it's trying to go. We do that one step at a time. So pack, this whole idea of breaking data into these little chunks and then moving it in this way was completely revolutionary when it was proposed. And again, the, the phone company executives hated this idea because it, it, it kind of was antithetical to everything they believed in. They understood these circuit switch networks. There's actually a story about some of the earliest people that were proponents of packet switch networks were interacting with the phone company and the phone company set up like a whole multi-day symposium where they brought in a bunch of their engineers and a bunch of their, you know, people, and it basically was all designed to convince these one or two people that packet switching was a bad idea. That's all the, the whole goal was, was to talk them out of this terrible idea. The, the two people went, they were like, no, we, we're, we're, we're still right, right? And it turns out that they were. So today, most of the time, when you talk on a phone, particularly a mobile phone, the first thing that happens on your phone is your voice gets digitized and broken into little packets. And so even these old voice connections that were the foundation of, you know, the telecommunications networks that preceded the internet, even they have been replaced by packets and packet switch networks, right? We've just decided that this is the right way to do it, and now even more, most voice traffic uh, moves that way. All right. So one of the, so, you know, one of the cool things about IP is that it doesn't do much. And by not doing much, it gave birth to this really beautiful ecosystem of other protocols that are allowed to run on top of it. So if you want to develop an internet protocol today, you can do that. You can write your own protocol with its own rules for doing a particular type of thing, and you can run it on top of the internet protocol. And so we've come up with all of these new protocols, and this is the one we're gonna talk a little bit about today, that exist to serve specific applications. So one of the reasons we're talking about this is I wanna dissuade you from this idea that's very normal to hold that the internet is the web. The World Wide Web is one application that runs on top of the internet protocol. It has its own protocol, it has its own formats that we're gonna talk about a little bit in a minute, it has you know, um, a certain use, you guys use it all the time, but it's not the only thing that we do with the internet. All right, so there's something called the Hypertext Transfer Protocol. What service or application does this support? Does anybody know? I suspect you know the answer to this. Where do you see HTTP? Or frequently, HTTPS? in your browser bar. Yeah, so this is the protocol that supports the World Wide Web. We're gonna talk a little bit about HTTP in a minute. HTTP is a separate protocol with its own rules, but it runs on top of IP. So IP provides the transport layer for all of these higher level protocols, okay? But HTTP is not alone. What about this? Anyone know what SMTP is? This supports something that you guys do all the, well, I don't know, some of you are starting to see this as an irritation. Um, because you're using newer communication mediums, but still pretty important to read what? SMTP supports something from time to time, you guys get important blanks. Anybody know? Yeah. Email, yeah. SMTP supports email, and that's actually SMTP is interesting. SMTP is the protocol that mail servers use to talk to each other. So when you send a message to your friend that goes to another school, the first place that message goes is a server on campus, then the server on campus at some point will send the, your message over to the server at the other school using something called the Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, or SMTP. A DNS, this is one of the ones that does not 
end with P, but it is itself a protocol. Again, this is something, another one you guys use all the time. Every time you go to a website, every time you send an email message, every time you do anything online. Anybody know what this does? Yeah. Yeah, so DNS is responsible for, so, so you know, we, when we looked at those IP addresses, how many, no, how many people have ever typed an IP address into their browser bar? Like, you, you, probably, you probably shouldn't do that, by the way. It's usually a bad idea, but most of us don't do that. We don't type 172.22.85.11 into our browser bar. We might type facebook.com or google.com or whatever, right? DNS is responsible for translating the human readable names that you guys use that are good for humans, like cs125.cs.illinois.edu, to actual IP addresses that can then be used by the IP source. So every time you guys load a web page, the first thing that happens is your web browser has to figure out, okay, they typed in this, this uh, web address, what IP address does it uh, correspond to? And you can invent new internet protocols. This has not been as big of a deal recently. People are, um, I think there's been more activity in building new protocols on top that sort of uh, operate within the existing ones. But there have been some cases recently where big companies, so, so for example, Google. Google, you should be a little bit afraid of, uh, Google operates a highly used website. In fact, it operates a bunch of highly used websites, Google.com, Google Docs, Gmail, whatever. It also provides a browser. So a lot of times, some of you are using a Google piece of software, your web browser, to talk to another Google piece of software, one of Google's websites. And Google's actually started to experiment with a new transport protocol that's built on top of IP, but it's designed to replace some of the other transport protocols that are out there, because they said, you know what? Those older protocols don't work very well. So if you're Google and you control both sides of a lot of network connections, you can get away with it. All right, so I just want to, I just want, before we talk about the web, I just want to make sure we understand the internet itself represents a framework, a backbone on which a bunch of different protocols are built, okay? And, you know, there is, there, there's, uh, there's whole bunches of other protocols I haven't talked about here. So if you look at the traffic that's going across the internet at any given point in time, is a lot of it web traffic? Probably but there's a lot of other types of information and other protocols that are also using the internet. A lot of it's email, there's uh, ch specific protocols designed for chat, and other types of information exchange. All right, so now let's talk about the web. All right, so now we have some vague idea of what the internet is, as physical infrastructure, as protocol, and as a building block for other protocols where we want to exchange information between computers. So the World Wide Web is one specific protocol, HTTP, which we already talked about. The HTTP protocol establishes a way for two computers to exchange information. It gives me a way to request data from a server, um, and also a way to send data to a server. There's two other parts of, HT of the web that you might be familiar with, actually three other parts. One is something called a markup language. So this is HTML. We'll go through each one of these briefly in a minute. HTML provides some of the content that is moved around by the World Wide Web, although not all of it. The HTML provides a way to uh, uh, give your browser a semantic description of what a website should look like that the browser then renders into what you see, okay? The web also has a styling language called CSS that's used to control how websites look. And then there's also a programming language that's heavily associated with the web called JavaScript. One thing I will get out of the way right now and help you with, because it took me about 10 years to figure this out, there is no relationship between JavaScript and Java, okay? I'm serious, I thought this for a long time, for real. I was like, oh, it's the scripting version of Java, whatever that means, right? Uh, JavaScript is it's a completely different language. It, unfortunately, they have this similar name. Uh, they are completely different languages. It's a fun, how they co-evolved is a fun story, um, but they have nothing to do with each other. Like Java and JavaScript have no formal relationship other than the fact that they're both computer programming languages. All right, so let's look at each one of these in turn. 
So when we talked about the IP protocol, we said protocols establish structured communication between two parties. This is what they do in a, compu in a computer system. Protocols set rules that need to be followed. That's something that they do both in a computer system and, you know, in diplomatic exchange, for example. So the HTTP protocol defines a bunch of different verbs or different types of ways that a client can interact with the server. So when we talk about HTTP, we're normally assuming that there's some client somewhere that's a device that you operate, okay, your phone, your web browser, and then there's a server somewhere. So somewhere in a server room, somewhere on campus, I don't know where it is, is a machine, it's actually a virtual machine, but that's not important, whose job it is, one of its jobs, is to serve cs125.cs.illinois.edu. There's a machine that does that. There's a web server that we set up somewhere that does that. So your client, so when you go to our homepage, your client sends a request to our server and says, hey, I want to see the content of this page, okay? So every time you load a page, the request type that's used is something called a get request, okay? A get does what it sounds like. It sends, hey, I want some stuff. I want some information, okay? Ah, what's going on here? Why this is happening so often today? Something's weird with the campus IT infrastructure. The only other uh, request that's somewhat interesting to talk about, HTTP has like dozens of these, right? You can go and look up, and they have, they have some of them are useful, but the other one that you use all the time is something called a post. So get requests are used to ask the server to send you some information. A post request is used by your browser to send information to the web server. And when you think about most of the browsing you do online, it's, it's, most of it's a pretty one-way relationship. The server's sending you lots and lots of information. Um, you're not contributing very much back. But there are times in which you do. You post on Facebook. You buy something on Amazon. You, you know, uh, click back and forth on our slide decks or whatever. Every one of those actions represents a case where your browser has some information it needs to send to the server. You need to tell Facebook, hey, I've got this new post for my feed. You need to tell Amazon, yes, I want to put that item in my cart, or yes, I want to buy everything in my cart, right? So every time you submit a form of any kind, pretty much any time you press submit or enter, and something changes about the world that you can observe, what your browser has done is sent a post request. That's a way to, for your browser to send data to the server, okay? So get and post have slightly different semantics. I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but part of the idea here is that git is not supposed to change anything about the world. All git does is send you some data. The request that's allowed to change something about the world is post. So you should be able to get a page over and over and over again and nothing changes. With post, on the other hand, something changes. Your Facebook feed has a new item on it. Your credit card gets charged and there's stuff that's being shipped to you from whatever vendor you use online, right? Okay. So, so how many people, uh, we've, we've usually, we've sort of made this go away, but how many people have gotten those warnings about like, don't resubmit the form again because whatever, something bad will happen? This is why, right? Because sometimes if you resubmit a form, you might get like twice the number of items in your cart that you were expecting, right? All right, so let's talk about these building blocks of, of the web for a minute. All right, so if HTTP defines how we ask a server for information, there's also a, um, the question of what do we get back? When you go and browse and load a website, what do you receive from the server? So this is a little bit of chunk of HTML. I'm not gonna go through this in detail. This is like enough content for a whole nother class. Um, but HTML describes how a page is structured, okay? Now, structure and how it looks are different, okay? And they're separated on the web. So here's, a, here's an example of HTML content, right? So this tag, does anyone know what an H1 is? An HTML, anyone want something for it? Yeah, this is a uh, top-level header. HTML defines a bunch of different header types, and the idea is sort of like, an H1 is more important than an H2, which is more important than an H3, which is more important than an H4, which is more important than an H6, right? Like there's six header types, okay? So this is like some important content on the page. That's all I know about it. 
the website doesn't tell me here that this should be big or bold or whatever. It just says this is important. So this is semantic information. Then I have something called a P, so each one of these, this is the open tag and this is the closed tag. So the open tag is P and then the closed tag is like a forward slash followed by the open tag. So what's in here is a paragraph. Again, this is semantic information. This is a paragraph of text. I don't know anything more about that except that it's a paragraph that you might see in a book, right? It might have some white space above it. It might have some white space below it. It's a single unit of, inf of textual information, right? It's not a sentence. It's not a word. It's not a character. It's a little bit higher level than that. It's a paragraph, okay? I have something down here. Anyone know what an OL is? Anyone went down a little bit of, uh, of HTML hacking? Yeah. This is a list, and it's an ordered list. So HTML has two types of lists. There's both an ordered and an unordered list. And then inside my list, each one of my list items starts with an, uh, a tag called li, and then, so these are items in the list. So first I say I'm gonna have a list, and then I have the items that are inside of it. Now again, a lot of times, ordered lists are rendered using numbers, right? Unordered lists are rendered using bullet points or some other thing to indicate it's a list. And now down here, I've got, again, here's a, here's a tag called strong. What does that mean? I don't know. Strong, it means the text inside here is strong, right? Sort of deserves some emphasis. The thing I want you to note about this is that, again, this is semantic. There is no instructions here about how this should look. Nowhere does it say strong should be bold. Nowhere does it say H1 should be bigger. No one does it say, nowhere does it say a paragraph should have a little bit of white space on top and bottom, or whatever, right? Nowhere does it say that an ordered list should start with numbers. That's not part of the semantics, right? That's part of layout. So if you loaded this into your web browser, here's how it would look, okay? And you notice here that my web browser has made the text in the H1 big. Oh, stop that, please. Um, and it's also added numbers to my list, and it's put this in bold. And it's added some white space above and below the paragraph. The browser, by default, comes with what's called a built-in style sheet that'll do some of this by itself. So if you don't give it any information, the browser says, you know what, I think an H1 should be big and bold, right? And so that's what I'm gonna do. I think an ordered list should have numbers attached to it. So it'll kind of do some of this by default. If you want to, what happened to my CSS? I wanna come back and do this in a minute. All right, so let's talk about CSS. We'll go back and talk about the, the uh, evolution of stuff. So what CSS does is it defines how the website looks, okay? And again, I'm gonna just skim over this. But a CSS file or CSS uh, set of rules is sent along with the page and it allows you to tell the browser how you want the page to look. So here I've set up some rules. So for example, my H1 is going to be 48 pixels font size, okay? And I want it to be bold. I also want the font that's used for the body of the document, that's pretty much the whole thing, to be a sans serif font. So that's a font that doesn't have those little, you know, uh, sharp things on the corners, okay? So now, here's what my page looks. If I send that previous page with this piece of CSS, what happens is I get that. That's awesome. I have, you can see that my title is still large, but my content has no, um, has no serifs. Um, and so I've given the, in the browser some more information about how things should look, okay? All right. So here's the fun part, all right? Uh, and here, we'll talk about this and we'll go back and talk about the evolution of the web. So the web has become, when the web started out, it was essentially a way to distribute documents, okay? You sent me a website and I looked at it. And I was like, that's a nice document. So you can think of the early web as kind of being like a nicer version of PDF. You know, most PDFs. Some PDFs are now trying to do fancy, unnecessary things, right? Uh, but most of them don't. They're just like a document you look at, right? It's a web page. At this point, what started to happen is that the web has become, instead of just a framework for distributing documents, the web is a tool used to distribute code. 
Every time you go to a website, almost every website you use, unless you're using some like really dinosaurish old website that has like refused to add any of this, along with the HTML, along with the CSS, you also get a piece of code written in a language called JavaScript, okay? JavaScript code runs in your browser. Your browser knows how to interpret JavaScript. So that's actually a way, if you want, to open up a special tab in your browser where you can actually type code into it and it will run it for you, okay? So what happens is, you know, and, and I shouldn't say what happens is, this is entirely what powers interactive websites, Google Docs, you know, all the music players you guys use, all the photo apps you guys use, pretty much everything you do online. Try disabling JavaScript. You can still do this in most browsers. You can turn it off. And you will discover that nothing about the internet works anymore, okay? The reason is that every website you visit is actually now a small computer program, sometimes a huge computer program. Like Google Docs is incredibly complicated, right? It's a full-blown editor. It's like trying to be Microsoft Word, but it's written in JavaScript and it runs in your browser, okay? So here's, and, and again, you know, I could teach a whole course on JavaScript, and I'm certainly not gonna um, get that across in two minutes that I have left, but here's a little piece of JavaScript. Okay, and I'm not gonna explain what this does or whatever or what the semantics are. This, there are probably pieces of this will look a little bit familiar to you uh, if you program Java, but some of this is gonna look very unfamiliar. JavaScript is a very different language. So here's what this does. This piece of JavaScript will bring us back in time, back to the days of terrible web design and back to the days where you would end up on a page like this, right? Anybody remember blinking text? Yeah, you're all too young. Right? It used to be that, like, this was like one of the primary ways that websites would get your attention. You would like go to the website and like five different parts of it would be blinking, you know? Blinking, blinking, blinking. They would never be synchronized, it'd all be a little off, right? All like, you know, so again, like do I have your attention? This is a simple web page and it's blinking, right? That's done with this piece of code. That's all I added to the previous example, okay? And again, I'm not gonna go over what this does, but by providing JavaScript, my page can now become a computer program. And that's so cool, right? I mean, again, most of what you guys um, browse online are now not web pages. They are web applications. You send email online, you're using a web application. You might write a paper online, you're using a web application. I think fairly quickly, I, I expect within <coughs> five years, 10 years, most of the programming that we do is gonna be done online. You guys already do that in Prairie Learn, but think of something like Android Studio, maybe a little bit less fully featured, but that runs in your browser. You don't have to do any setup, you know, you don't have to store anything locally, you just go to a website, it's kind of like the Google Docs or the Microsoft Online, whatever it is, version of our current IDEs. That program is going away. It's gonna be implemented online, and that'll be a lot more convenient. Okay, so, so this, you know, JavaScript really reflects you know, the evolution of the web. So at some point, again, what happened is that most of the sites we visit sent you a document, okay? Then we entered an era where when you browse to the site, it would think a little bit, okay? It would, it would use some information about you. So a great example of a site like this is any store that you go to, right? Particularly really sophisticated e-commerce platforms like Amazon.com. So when you go to Amazon.com, you don't get the same page that somebody else in the room does, or that somebody else in a different city does, or someone else in a different country does. Amazon uses all the information it knows about you to produce a homepage that is designed with one goal in mind. And what do you think that goal is? They get you to buy something, right, you know? So the idea was, Amazon was like, well no, there's no one page that's gonna work well to get e everyone everywhere to buy something. Instead, I'm gonna tailor the page to each user. So again, when you go to Amazon, it, the page it produces is not sitting there on disk somewhere, it's created on the fly. And it's created based on everything that Amazon knows about you, where the request is coming from, who you are if you're logged into Amazon, what you've purchased recently, all this information it uses to produce this one beautiful page with one goal, okay? And so, but now we're into this era where it's much more common for a page to rather than do a lot of work on the server, to basically send you a big chunk of JavaScript, okay? Um, 
where the server essentially provides data, but the JavaScript that runs in your browser is doing most of the work. So for example, our grade page works this way. So when you go to our grade page, when it's working, it's probably down right now along with everything else. When you go there, what happens is that this framework sends you a huge amount of JavaScript, that starts to run. It requests data from our server about your grades in the class and then uses that to render a page that shows you, you know, the graphs and the scores that you see. Okay. So let's go, okay, so now I have 10 minutes, and so now I can, you know, get to the place that we were trying to go all this whole time, which is what is a web API. All right, so we had the internet. We had the web, and, and it's, it, you know, people started to realize, hey, this is a great way of moving data around. And I have these two things I can do with the web server that are important. I can request information and I can send it data, all right? So what else could I do inside this framework, okay? So the first thing we have to, we have to unpack is what an API is, okay? So an API is an application program or interface. Remember we talked about interfaces when we talked about Java, and I said this was a general concept that applied, you know, much farther than just the Java concept of an interface. An interface describes the set of things that an entity can do for you, okay? An application programmer interface is specifically designed for you to use. You are the application programmer in that sentence. The interface is provided by somebody else, and what they're doing is they're saying, hey, if you want to build an app that integrates with our service, like let's say you want to process photos online, let's say you want to build something that uses data from GitHub, let's say that you want to use weather data, whatever. Let's say you want to use data about the bus service around here, which is publicly available. I'll provide a way for you to get that information. And maybe I'll provide a way for you to do various things over the web. This is called an API. It's an application program interface. It's for you, the application program. So here's, let, let's, let's go through this with a simple example. So here's an example weather API, okay? And you can imagine designing this. This probably has a lot more functions than this, right? Um, but here's an example of a weather API in Java, okay? So I have some weather info class that my, these functions are returning, and I have a way to get the weather at a particular location. I have a way to get the weather at a particular location at a particular time. These are overloads. And then I have a way to figure out a location. So these require this weather location object, right? How do I produce one of those? Well, let's say the user gives me a string that says Champaign, Illinois, and I wanna use that to produce a weather location. I can do that as well, okay? So these three functions working together might be part of an actual interface I could create in Java, and the idea here is to create something that allows me to query the weather, okay? I'm assuming I have data about the weather that I'm trying to provide, right? I'm like the National Weather Service or something like that, okay? Now, you could, pr you could probably find like a Java library that would allow you to do this. You would just program it up in Java like you normally would, and you'd have to figure out like how to use the library you know, what are the fields on a weather info object, you know, blah, 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 right? But consider that I can do the following. I can send information to the server, okay? And I actually have a couple of ways I can do this. There's also something called URL parameters in a Git request, which we'll talk about in a minute or on Wednesday. And the server can run code, and it can return a response. And here's the thing that's key, okay? The data that a website sends back does not have to be HTML, okay? I can set up a website that sends back anything. I can send back uh, text. I can send back binary data that corresponds to a photo. I can send back whatever I want. And so a web API will typically not give you a website. It's not gonna give you a web page, that's gonna give you an HTML document. Why not? Because the information it sends back is to be used by a program, not by a person. It's not something you're gonna look at. A website's designed to be rendered so that you can see it and process it visually. Data, we need to structure a different way. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna utilize the fact, to build a web API, we're gonna leverage the fact that a web, the web protocol allows us to move stuff around, and the web protocol does not dictate that the content returned from a get, 
request be HTML. I can send back anything I want. This is a historical reason, so one of the reasons people started doing this is it was hard to build custom protocols because the uh, computer security people on campus um, decided that it was unsafe to run these protocols and they blocked them for a variety of reasons. But HTTP is typically uh, something that you can use. And so this is one of the reasons people started building essentially protocols and new interfaces on top of HTTP rather than building a new internet protocol. All right, how much time do I have left? I think this is probably a good spot to stop and pick up on Wednesday. Um, I have a couple of announcements today that are important. So uh, the first one is the blue team finished the machine project last night. Congratulations to them. Um, the orange team has their due date tonight. Hopefully we can get the grading server propped up again. Um, all right, so the last thing you guys have ahead of you, machine project-esque, is the final project. The final project description is not up yet for anybody to view. We will have it up tomorrow for you guys to review in lab, and tomorrow's lab will be the first time that you get to start working on it, which will start with finding a partner, okay? You're finding a team to work. Okay, so this week's quiz, I just wanna, so this is important, you guys are gonna wanna hear this. This week's quiz, the multiple choice questions are on sorting. The programming questions are not on sorting. Okay? The reason for that is if I give you code for a sorting algorithm in the multiple choice questions, I'm not dumb enough to ask you to then implement that sorting algorithm <laughs> in the multiple in the programming questions, all right? So we'll do that after break, when hopefully you've forgotten everything you ever learned about sorting. All right, I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Good luck finishing up the machine project.